Okay, so as you would have heard from Karen and Catherine in the previous modules, development of a food frequency questionnaire, particularly for flavonoid foods and food intakes, requires something to get from the food information to the nutrient information. But what exactly do we need there? We need food composition data. Now food composition data is something that you may not be aware of or may have taken for granted as just a set of numbers on a screen or in a piece of software. But it's something that's a lot more than that. There's a lot of consideration in relation to the food types, the environment, and of course, the use of the data afterwards. So food composition databases globally consist of two primary sources, the survey database and the reference database. Now in Australia, those databases are referred to as the OSNUT database, which is our survey database, and the NUTTAB database, which is our reference database. The NUTTAB database is primarily composed of analysed foods in the laboratory, whereas the survey database or the OSNUT database is comprised of a whole set of foods based on intake from the previous survey for which it was created. So for example, our most recent survey was the Australian Health Survey conducted in 2011 and 13. From this, we have OSNUT 2011-13, and it was based on all the foods reported by the people using a 24-hour recall method. That is the database that we've used to expand and build on other analyses and try and create some values for us for flavonoid intakes. Now flavonoid intakes, of course, are required for a number of different studies across the globe. Many studies have looked at single components or multiple components, as per the table that you can see on screen now. So of the two food composition databases available to us, the OSNUT and the NUTTAB database in Australia, we need to consider which one is most appropriate for the analyses that we need to conduct. If we're looking at dietary assessment intake in particular, it is best to use the database that was developed from the survey, so our OSNUT database. And this therefore was used as the basis to us developing a flavonoid database specific to Australian intakes. Now having a survey database and a reference database is very useful to many countries. So not only does Australia have this, but the United States, Europe, a number of countries across Africa and some countries across Asia also have these two reference databases available to them for food composition. Flavonoid food composition databases, however, are much harder to find. There is a very, very limited set of information in this space and the majority of this information is actually coming through in the form of systematic literature review type analyses where they extract data from published studies to create the database itself. Now the known food composition databases in this space are the USDA and the Fennel Explorer databases or those of the United States and of Europe and up until this point we haven't had any data that was suited to the Australian food supply to create a flavonoid database for Australian foods. This makes it particularly challenging when trying to analyse dietary intakes which have Australian food information in them. Now many of these food composition databases also include incomplete or unsuitable food flavonoid values. Now incomplete values give us only part of the picture of dietary intake of, of a group of people. So if we're missing particular values for particular foods or if we're missing particular types of flavonoids, this is no, not going to give us the same information as if we had the full set. Similarly, if we didn't have all the types of flavonoids available to us or unsuitable flavonoid food information, such as the use of that from another country, this would also give us inaccurate information. For this reason, we've expanded the OSNUT database, as I've mentioned earlier, to create anthocyanin, which is a type of flavonoid, anthocyanin values for us to be able to use here in Australia. So the availability of an Australian food composition database for flavonoids in particular means we can then analyse food intakes that have been reported by people in Australia with food information that is available for Australian foods. Now this previously wasn't possible. We had to use the USDA or the, the American database or the European Phenol Explorer database. These also created some challenges for us because we only had, for example, PDF versions or hard copy versions available. So we couldn't use software packages such as Foodworks to automate some of that process. This new database we have available, as you see later on, actually allows us to use Foodworks and speeds the whole process up quite substantially. So the database that was developed was specific to Australian foods and it's also been tailored to only include anthocyanin contents of particular foods reported in the Australian Health Survey. So it's been adapted to the OSNUT database, which means it was our survey database and it's the most appropriate then to be used for any other intake analyses that we need for Australian intakes. So how do I know how much I'm eating from these fruits? 
So these grapes, for example, you can see they're quite dark in colour and it's likely that they therefore contain quite a large amount of anthocyanins. So if we have a look at the database, you can see that the value that comes up for the anthocyanins in total for the grapes would be higher than, say, for your strawberries that you've got there in your hand as well. Okay. So the variability of foods is something that we really need to think about when we're looking at food composition data. So are you trying to say that if I travel to the US, I will be getting a different amount of anthocyanins from the strawberries in the US than what I'll be getting in Australia. That's right, that's right. Because our growing conditions differ between the two countries. So we have also have very different soil conditions and of course our sunlight varies as well between the two countries. All of those different factors alongside when we harvest it and how mature the fruit itself is will all depend on how much anthocyanin is in the food. So maybe if you cook those strawberries or if you froze the strawberries it might even have a further impact. Hmm. Nice points. Hmm. Due to the variability that we've already discussed that is inherent in foods, so the soil conditions, the lighting conditions and the harvesting conditions, you can see here just between the database of the Australian nutrient values and the United States nutrient values for apples in this particular example, we can see some substantial changes in the content of particular nutrients. So we've only selected a few examples here for you, but you can just see with beta carotene, for example, for an apple, our Australian Osnut value gives you a value of only 10 milligrams per 100 grams, while the US value gives you 27 milligrams per 100 grams. The same thing then applies for a few of the other nutrients, which are obtained in much smaller values from these foods. But if we have a look down at the bottom at the folate equivalents, there's quite a substantial difference. Now, when we were creating our anthocyanin database for Australian flavonoid intakes, we needed to use a conversion factor. This conversion factor needed to consider either the USDA or the Phenol Explorer values, which are available databases for flavonoid content. Now, to convert these to Australian values, we also needed to consider the moisture value of the food items for comparability between the countries. So as you'll see on screen here, we actually have the PDF version of the USDA database available for you. So it's a large table with many, many different foods listed and all of the different types across the screen. Now at the moment I've selected the raspberry example to be able to show comparability of anthocyanins in particular between the United States and the European data. And then I'll also show you an example of how that um, changes between with the Australian data. So you can see here for cyanidin, we have 90 milligrams per 100 grams for these red raspberries. And if we then flick across to have a look at Phenol Explorer, which is available for you on the internet as well. Same thing, I've selected red raspberries for anthocyanin content. If we have a look here at the cyanidin, we only have 0.53 milligrams per 100 grams. Now that's quite a substantial difference between what was stated in the United States database. And when you're selecting a particular food composition database to analyse dietary assessment intake with, this type of variability is key and this is something that you really need to think carefully about in terms of which database is selected. Now the useful information here in the Phenol Explorer European database is it actually tells us here how many samples have been used to create this current mean value of 0.53. So only three samples of red raspberry have been used to create the cyanidin. But if you have a look further down, some of the subtypes of cyanidin, so some of the compounds that it is linked with in terms of the free sugars, have actually had larger numbers of samples taken. So that value that's given to us in these further rows of cyanidin breakdown are probably more valid than the total cyanogen value that we see at the top here. If we jump back to the USDA, we can see there's been a breakdown of only the total cyanogen. We don't have the component items, but we do have a total of 191 samples that were taken. So this one should be quite a robust value and it should be quite, strategic, quite strategically analysed. Now what I'll do is I'll jump across to the Foodworks software. Foodworks software has recently had our Australian expanded anthocyanin database added to it. So it's yet to be released in 2017, but it's a very exciting development because the work from the University of Wollongong has actually gone in 
and is usable in this database no matter where you use the Feedworks software. So I've limited the viewpoints that you can see on screen so that you can really see the anthocyanin information here on the right hand side. But you'll see we do have the total anthocyanin and we also have the breakdown of the key component types of anthocyanins that are available in the published literature. So for comparability's sake, I'll type in raspberry, select the raw raspberry, and all food composition data is shown per 100 grams of intake. So I'll make sure that that's consistent and select 100 grams. And you can see here, we have a cyanogen value of 135 milligrams per 100 grams. Now that's a lot closer to one of the values, but much further away from one of the other values. So again, another point to think about when selecting the database. However, if you are using data from Australian intake studies, now that we have this database available in Foodworks, it is the best option for us to choose for Australian values. So as we've seen now, by having a look at the USDA, the Federal Explorer, and also the expanded OSNUT database in the Foodworks software using red raspberries, there are some substantial differences between those different sets of data, really emphasising the need to use the correct database for the correct dietary intake data being collected. So on the table that you can see here on the screen, we've compared values for a few other types of fruits and vegetables. So for strawberries, blueberries, plums, and red cabbage for anthocyanin data as well. Now you can see again, quite substantial variability in the values. In particular, if I, show, if I point you towards the blueberry values for the Australian data, this reaches 381 milligrams per 100 grams of blueberry by comparison to only 133 milligrams per 100 gram in the Fennel Explorer database from the European data studies. Now it's also worth flagging in this particular table that values for red cabbage are not available in the Fennel Explorer database for Europe. This means that when, when creating the European database, there were no valid studies available for red cabbage that could be added to the data set to be used for analysis of European intakes. We do have values for Australian data and we do have values for the USDA data. Now the challenge to you all is, can you create similar data to this for some other fruits and vegetables using these databases yourself?